Good evening to all of you. Many of you look a little tired with a lot of information overload over the day. You've accumulated tons of information. And I'm here to actually give you some information about abdominal conditions in children. So that's the kind of job I do. I look at uh, children's bellies, both inside and outside, and look after children's livers as well. Um, what I'll actually deal with is some really important and maybe emergent kind of issues, what you need to know. Um, now we'll actually sort of go a little into a prelude. We'll look at infancy, and what I'm going to talk about is the stool color of infants. It's not very glamorous talking about motion, color, and things like that, but it's really important for us to know. Normally when we eat food, even if we take curd rice or drink milk, which is white in color, once it enters the intestine, it gets stained green because of bile, which comes from the liver. The liver, every cell in the liver produces bile, and that goes through bigger and bigger channels and enters the intestine, and it colors the motion green. So by the time it comes out, it becomes yellow or brown because of some chemicals which get added to it and some fermentative effects of bacteria which live inside the gut. So we normally expect motion to be yellow or green or greenish yellow. People call it different names, mustard yellow. So that's normally the kind of motion. Even in adults as well as grown up children, we like it to be yellow or greenish yellow. We don't want it to be red, which means blood. We do not want it to be black, which means blood which is coming from higher up, like let's say the stomach. And we don't want it to be white, because then the bile is actually not flowing and coloring the motion yellow. This assumes a lot of importance, especially in early infancy. And uh, I remember my own times, I have seen some babies when I was a small child, especially when you go to marriages and relatives basically are changing nappies of their children, white motion, but you do not know. And the mothers say, oh, he's drinking milk, that's why his motion is white, which is actually not true. You're supposed to see some yellow in the motion. So people talk about different colors, especially pale white, china clay-like stools, magnolia, beige, cream. These colors of stools are not normal for a baby who's less than three months of age. It has got a certain importance because the ducts which carry bile from the liver, they may actually not form, or even after they are formed, may actually become uh, shrunken, which is called atrophy in uh, medical terms. So if this happens, then the liver can't excrete the bile. And bile doesn't stay just like that. It irritates the liver and forms scar tissue in the liver, and the liver becomes more and more hard. And that has got lots of consequences. One particular condition we are worried about is a condition called biliary atresia. So in this, the ducts carrying bile from the liver, instead of being like a tube which has got a lumen and can carry uh, bile, it actually becomes solid and it becomes like a, a, a cord kind of a thing. So the liver suffers damage and some of these children may actually experience liver failure in the time to come. Early detection helps us to correct it surgically in a good majority of them, but the key factor is timing. You have to detect it early in advance so that the successes of the operation are really, really reaped in this particular instance. Can I have the next slide, please? So normal stool color of infants, so H1 to H5, we don't do technicalities. We use our eye, and if it actually looks a normal color, okay, go for a pass. Can I have the next slide, please? So these stool colors are rather more pale, and this should raise a suspicion whether there is something wrong in these kinds of infants. Sometimes the stool color change may be the early sign which we need to pick up. Children may also look yellow in their eyes. The urine, on the other hand, may be more darker, and the stools are paler. And this is a kind of uh, a suspicious combination which should trigger a referral to your pediatrician or to the other doctor or to gastroenterologist, for example. Next slide, please. So this is what I was talking about biliary atresia, where the uh, channels actually have become very narrow and uh, they are actually like a cord. And the only thing is we may run out of time to correct it properly and to give children uh, a good kind of clinical course if we don't detect it on time. 
So if you do not operate a child with this kind of problem within two months of age, the operation usually may not be successful. And uh, this kind of condition sometimes may result in children needing a liver transplant to fix their problem. So only two important things. Stools must be yellow. And if they are green, they're acceptable. Brown is acceptable. But white, pale, cream, shades of green, not acceptable. Next slide, please. And here we have a photograph of a child whose eyes are yellow. And uh, let us say he has a suspect stool and he has a dark urine, then he is someone who needs to be seen urgently by a pediatrician and other professionals to fix him. Next slide, please. So, stool color was one thing. Now, maybe some of you have seen raised hands for children who are 10 to 15 and 5 to 10, possibly not anyone more younger than that, but obviously the information would come handy for you to pass it on to someone who have children of the right age or just to become new mothers. Uh, now, my next talk is about foreign body ingestion in children. Majority of you would have had a child who has eaten a button or who has swallowed um, a piece of metal, possibly a coin. Coins are actually the commonest foreign bodies which are ingested by children. And uh, sometimes hair clips, I do get hair clips, especially the bendy ones, which have a, a, a little clicky thing within them. They are actually quite popular among kids. And the earrings of mothers. Mothers are very worried, especially if children ingest diamond rings, you know, because they think the ring is lost forever. But uh, if they're careful, they can retrieve it from the feces after washing it properly. But uh, that does happen from time to time. Sometimes you've seen very odd objects like bent screws. I've seen the nightmare objects like an open safety pin in the throat. So they are kind of scary for me too and for everyone. So what happens is children like to put everything in the mouth. Uh, in fact, there is a particular theory called uh, Sigmund Freud's uh, theory of how actually we get gratification by using different parts of a body. In the first two to three years, the mouth is the source of gratification for children. That's why you see the children who hold on to their dummies for the entire day, some children who are thumb suckers during day and night, and they want to put everything in the mouth because they feel some pleasure by doing that. So everything is mouth, texture, color, taste, and uh, they basically accidentally slip it in the mouth as well. So some of these objects can be really small, innocent nature, which don't react with their body, and may actually come out through the other end rather without any problems. Especially objects which are less than 20 millimeters or two centimeters in diameter, and if they have soft surfaces or they basically sort of uh, uh, have molded edges, they may actually pass on. The lightweight ones will pass on through the motion. But the problematic ones are metallic objects who actually get stuck in different parts of the system, especially the worst ones are which get stuck in the throat. Now, foreign body inhalations or aspirations can be really dangerous if they get into the respiratory tract. And I'm not the right kind of doctor to remove objects from the respiratory tract. I deal with things which go down the food pipe. Next slide, please. Now, here, this object is a coin which is actually stuck in the food pipe, in the upper end of the food pipe. So we call this an impacted coin in the food pipe. So it's impacted because it can't move from there. So if it doesn't move, it won't stay just like that. It will irritate the sides. And sometimes it can actually erode the lining and it can actually um, carve a hole. And uh, you may have big problems with air entering around the heart and things like that. So the coin looks like that on an endoscopic view. Next slide, please. The last one was a little innocent because it won't uh, actually chemically disturb your food pipe. But this one looks very similar to that. But this is far more dangerous. And this is called a button battery. So you see it in different kinds of electronic gadgetry, the button batteries. And some of the other children like them quite a lot. So you should keep them very safely and not allow them to have access to that. These button batteries, I just read up about it last night, how they produce electricity. And there is a positive and a negative, and there is what is called an electrolyte paste in between that. And when they get stuck in the food pipe, and saliva goes and gets deposited on it, this uh, electrolyte, especially potassium hydroxide, gets released, and it basically corrodes the whole food pipe. 
and uh, this is an alkali and what alkalis do is they make your whole tissue become just like cheese it becomes so soft your body doesn't offer any resistance anymore and it's easy to punch holes in your whole gastrointestinal tract and it's very bad when it actually happens in the food pipe i also thought my food pipe is just behind my breastbone but it's not true the food pipe is actually behind your heart just behind your heart so it's actually in a very very um, dangerous or a difficult area even for access and basically can cause quite a lot of problems if it spreads around so people call this mediastinitis and it can cause a lot of problems if it happens to do things around the heart so this one it needs to be removed by someone like me and uh, especially if it stays there for 12 hours or more it's a very scary thing because already it could have done quite a lot of damage to the food pipe so button batteries are not a good thing to have but if you have it you have to keep it securely and not allow any kids to have any access to these kinds of things and especially when buying toys we should be prudent not to buy toys where these button batteries can come out next slide please so this is a little slither of pvc this is a real case where a child actually had this thing down this um, food pipe there were a lot of construction activity in the house next one please this is the uh, open pin and the open pin is a scary thing next slide please so we do have an over tube into which we can pull the open pin and get it out sometimes the ents are actually called they do an operation to actually open it up luckily um, these are not very common but safety pins once again not a great idea to be put away especially the brooch pins and the safety pins and all that not great like what i told you children are inquisitive and they put anything they get in the mouth for a strange reason that's how it happens next one please and these are magnets so in uh, in let me say 15 16 years ago there was this a uh, uh, great issue about magnets and uh, there were these toys where you could make different models models of uh, lattice models of different things and play models they were called the bucky balls and these bucky balls are very very strong magnets and they're really really strong not the kind of magnets you use on the fridge it's a lot more stronger than them and uh, the bucky ball magnets they have a very great affinity the problem is if you swallow two magnets at once they will stick together and they'll stay and they'll possibly go out to the bottom and like that but if you stagger your take of magnets of a kid pops one now so what happens is these magnets can attract between the different areas of the intestine and they actually the attraction is so powerful that they punch a hole between two of them and you can have what is called a perforation and if you have a perforation the contents of the intestine will leak out into the rest of the belly and you can have um a very difficult situation or you may need an operation to actually sort it so these magnets are dangerous and uh, once again not to buy toys which have got strong magnetic parts and especially the toys where you can make different models on children play with the modeling things and all that not to actually invest in buying those magnets because they can be potentially dangerous even if the boy is 10 or 15 let's say there's a toddler in the house then it's dangerous for them next slide please So this is how they get attracted between the different uh, layers of the intestine and they can cause a perforation. Next one please. So this is a chicken bone. Next one please. This is a a ball of chicken someone swallowed and got stuck in the lower end of the food pipe. Next one please. So foreign body ingestion and prevention do not squander coins around the house. It's very good that we are all going very electronic these days and we do not have so much of change in our pockets. Nevertheless, vegetable shopping and all these kinds of bits and bobs we do. Children, if they are in the house, always to dispose the coins in a safe place or keep a little coin bank to leave everything in and dispose it off when it's possible. And not to use devices with button batteries or if you have to, like for example your car keys, you have button batteries inside it and you cannot live without it. It has to be kept safely again. happens clips screws nails earrings finger rings glass beads and plastic toys and we all know about plastic toy regulation up to the age of 36 months not to give children with any small parts nuts are also potentially dangerous peanuts i have actually been in situations where i have removed nuts as foreign objects but usually this has happened in children who have had previous malformations of their food pipe uh, and not to buy strong magnetic toys next slide please So this is actually uh, a particular um, 
Australian poster which I copied. It says button batteries can kill and they are found in different kinds of instruments including thermometers, hearing aids, toys and watches. Next one please. And these are the bucky balls which we need to avoid. Next one please. And uh, for foreign body ingestion, do not panic is the most important thing. If a child is choking, it is more likely in the respiratory tract. Yesterday, maybe you have done the um, scenario of the foreign body in the respiratory tract about the variations of the heme-rich maneuver and how you need to actually help them. But if a child is coughing, we should allow them to do it because cough is a protective mechanism. Doing blind finger sweeps inside the mouth is dangerous. You can injure them and you can actually push a foreign body deeper in. And um, he needs to get to the children's doctor or the emergency as soon as possible. X-rays may be advised to see where the foreign body is and decide on the treatment. We have different variety of instruments to go and fish these foreign bodies. So endoscopic procedures are rather more easy and quickly done under anesthetic. Next slide, please. Now, next topic is about corrosives. So time and again, we do actually get children who have ingested something which is very dangerous to them, like an acid or a bleach, alkali, or something else which actually corrodes or gnaws their GI tract. Uh, personal experiences, some of you may actually have known someone who has drunk caustic soda or have actually drunk bleach in the house. I know a boy recently who was in school before the COVID break and uh, the, they were actually um, working in the workshop area where the school bus was being repaired and uh, the uh, radiator battery fluid was kept for change and the boy just drank it because he was thirsty and that turned out to be sulfuric acid and he actually burnt his whole stomach and it took almost six weeks for him to recover. And uh, time and again we do get these kinds of situations particularly sad because um, sometimes it could be um, parents momentarily lost track of their children and children just did it just like that. So all these chemicals should be kept under lock and key and should not be kept on the bathroom floor. Very important. Cabinets should be locked especially when small children are around and uh, we should dispose of them off when the work is done of cleaning. And uh, the other things, dishwasher cleaners, all the cleaners for the hobs and all, they're all caustics and one needs to be very careful with them. Next slide, please. The three most common ones I have come across as uh, corrosives in the household are Harpic, which is hydrochloric acid. Uh, this Domex has got sodium hydroxide and Lysol has got potassium hydroxide. So the first one is acid, the other two are alkali. Now, we think acids are dangerous, but alkalis are equally or more dangerous. This is something we need to know. Alkalis will make your whole uh, tissue just like cheese and will actually punch holes. Acid actually burns the tissue and prepares a hard kind of S char, it's called. So acid burns can be limited, but alkali burns can be through and through. Next slide, please. So this is not to scare you. The inside may look a lot more horrible than this. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So corrosive ingestion, prevention is better than cure. Always lock the cabinets of um, the places where all these dangerous chemicals are kept. If accidental ingestion happens, what do people do? I have known people immediately inducing a vomiting. So never to induce vomiting after a corrosive ingestion because that will cause re-exposure of the food pipe to those materials and it will increase the quantum of burn. Next thing, not to give any dilutants. Many people will give cold milk from the fridge or they will give Eno or they basically um, will actually sort of uh, um, try and give them other kinds of household things which are actually not recommended. In corrosive poisoning, best thing is to take them to a properly qualified person or a doctor who actually deals with these kinds of things, emergency room. They normally, and we normally say doctors not to put any nasogastric tubes or tubes in the nose as well because you're blind when you're doing it. We normally would want to actually do an endoscopy early in these children to map the areas where the burns have happened to actually give them the right kind of guidance as to how long this treatment needs to go on, what kind of supportive measures they need. So first thing, not to panic, but not to give any neutralizing agents and not to induce vomiting. That is the most important thing. But as we said, prevention is better than cure. So storing it away, obsessively putting away the coins in the last scenario, not buying the magnetic toys, keeping the corrosives 
in a locked up place is very important. Not to squander these things near dishwasher fluid. That is also important. Dishwashers, there people think it's not particularly hazardous. They also have lots of alkali in them, hop cleaners, alkali in them. Toilet cleaners are assets, floor cleaners are bases. All these should be kept under lock and key. Very important. Because the long term consequences of damage done to the food pipe can actually scar someone's entire life keep on doing dilatations, dilatations, and they keep on getting major operations like pull-throughs and all. Next slide, please. So constipation, that is the last bit which I need to talk. So constipation constitutes 25% of my practice. I'm bored. <laughs> so we get a lot of them in different varieties. So majority of times what has happened is it's all half-heartedness. Parents have recognized but they have a lot of pressures from the outside as well. Some of them do not want to use medications because they think their child will get used to it. Sometimes they have overbearing in-laws and parents who would say, not to give medications, why do you need to give medications for that long? And your child will become dependent on it, maybe virtually for a lifetime. All these things are false. Constipation in 98% of cases in children are because of what we call as habitual. In 2% of cases, you may have a bodily problem, like let's say a thyroid problem or a calcium problem, or you're born with a malformation of your lower end, or some nerves have not migrated into the right place. But mm, by and large, majority of it is all in the head. And children need to be trained on time, and parents need a lot of perseverance and motivation to actually make them go. Children are ready to be toilet trained by the time they're 18 months. I'm surprised, my, my son was trained by the time he was 13 months, so my time scale is a little early. But basically because I'm a gastroenterologist, maybe he did it a bit early for me. <laughs> so what happens is, by the time the 18 months, you know, the uh, nappy culture is huge, and people buy tons of nappies and put the nappy on and all. Most of the times they have been to a marriage or they have been for a travel, or the child has had a fever or something like that, and he has not actually drunk enough of fluid. So for a day or two, he doesn't pass motion. And uh, on the third day, he innocently tries to pass motion. Unfortunately, because the body was uh, deprived of water, the motion had become too hard. The large intestine sucks up all the water from the poo. And the more longer the poo stays in the large intestine, it becomes like brick and bricks have ragged edges. And this particular piece of poo, when it comes out, it shears the bottom end. And that is called an anal fissure. And that is the starting point for a constipation. We call this as a sentinel event, because that marks from the time from where problems start. Children are very, very fiercely protective of their own bodies, and they do not like to be in pain. So the answer is now. I do not want to be in pain now, come what may. So what they tend to do is, if this particular act of defecation or passing motion has caused pain to them, the next time, more than likely, they don't want to go to motion. Because in their mind, they think that if I pass motion, I'll be in pain. So from there starts a very vicious kind of circle. So what we tend to do is they wouldn't sit down. And uh, they basically sort of would run away from the place, or they go and hide in a corner. Sometimes children develop what is called a withholding behavior, where they cross their legs and they actually hold the bottom end tight. They use the muscles not to pass motion, but to actually push it up so that they can postpone this whole act of defecation. So this is what uh, parents usually say. No, no, sir, my son sits and he screams and he screams and he screams as if he's in delivery pains, but he doesn't pass the motion out, which actually is not true. Because child is very clever. He will make all the sounds with the mouth, but he won't put the pressure at the bottom end because he thinks he'll be in pain. So, yeah. So what tends to happen is uh, the parents are worried, the grandparents are worried, the mum is hold, um, sort of, she's basically troubling this boy, is holding court, holding everyone to ransom in the house, and uh, in fact the whole family's dynamics work around the constipation of the child. Important thing is, toilet training should start early on. At least one poo a day. We are not being too greedy. One poo a day, soft motion every day. Best time to actually make them sit for a motion is after a meal, especially if it's a nighttime meal, that is good. Uh, but uh, people who are early wakers want to do it after the morning milk or something for the child. 
The Indian style or squatting posture is recommended because it puts the whole large intestine into a straight angle where the resistance to passage of motion is minimal. And the uh, importance is the family's eating habits are also very important, especially about fiber. We talk about fiber, prescribed fiber, this, that, everything. Fruits, yes, they have fiber, but greens have got a lot of fiber, gram per gram. So if they get a lot of greens, they put it in the papu or that's palkura and totkura and all the other kuras, they can give the child and uh, make him actually have a good poo. Drinking water is very important. And uh, most importantly, make children uh, feel that toileting is a routine and it's just like a brushing ritual what you do. So toileting also should happen like a second habit and they should do it. Now, trouble. If they actually get trouble, then medications are very much important. Medications, we use it like a slave. Medications are supposed to soften the motion so that in the coming weeks or months, the child may actually experience soft motion without any pain. And then he may cooperate to sit and go. So first time a child starts sitting, you have one half the battle. But when he starts going on his own one time a day without pain or uh, any blood in the motion, then you possibly are going to win. And it may take several months for the reset to happen. I normally give parents a time of 12 to 18 months for things to get reset. And I say, if you're actually really good, things may settle down a few months earlier than that. Once you give a time scale for constipation, parents are a little more relieved because really do not know how long it's going to take for the problem to get better. But if I tell them it's going to take several months to come, then they are okay with it. Initially, they're taken aback. They think this doctor basically has told me something which was not there in part of my understanding. But majority of times, what they think is 15 days of treatment is okay, month of treatment is okay. First, they would come and show me several prescriptions, say, I have been to several doctors now, and this is all what they've given me. I've exhausted all the different medicines, blah, de, blah, de, blah. And I would say, then that's too little. You need to actually hold on for longer, and then the medicines have changed and things like that. Okay, let's do the slides, please. So this is not very nice, but uh, type 1 and type 2 are constipated stools. The other ones are actually um, uh, normal stools, and the last few ones are basically sort of where you have liquid stools. But number one, just like uh, goat poo or rabbit poo is not good at all, and the second one is lumpy and sausage-like, like a uh, corn on a cob is also not very good. Next slide, please. So cause of constipation, change in feeds. Change formula in children. When children go on to formula, they may have hard stool. Change in the diet, different place, different kind of ingredients, not drinking enough water. Low fiber diet, don't want to sound very scientific, but a lot of milk ingestion. If a child drinks more than half a liter, 750 ml a day, they tend to get constipated, the full fat milk. Too much of chocolate. All fat reduces intestinal activity. Too much of fat, too much of ghee, too much of butter, too much of bakery items, too much of milk, all these have got a negative effect on intestinal motility as it's called. Fiber on the other hand, swells up in the intestine, holds on to water, bulks up the stool and helps you actually go to motion. Next one please. So functional constipation is habitual and there's no structural or abnormal uh, kind of metabolic or thyroid disorder or anything. Like I said, 98% of constipation in children is habitual and happens in the head. Next one, please. So we said a doctor has to exclude any causative disease. That's the whole idea of going to a doctor. Okay? But the majority of times there is no causative disease. Then parents would say, this problem is not getting sorted. I think there is something really wrong with my child. So obviously you go through a list and say majority of times it's okay, but a few tests may be advised just for clarification. Diet, fluid, exercise and toilet training. Medications are very important. No child will get addicted to a medicine and they won't have any cumulative toxicity, which means accumulating in the body and dependency is very minimal. You don't give the medicine today, your child will have a heart through the next day morning. Simple as that. There's no addiction, no allergic potential, no cumulative toxicity, and no dependency on this medicine. And this is particularly important because there's a huge overbearing effect of grandparents on young parents. When they have small children, they get a lot of inputs from the grandparents also, who may actually impose on them their own value systems and their judgments and stereotypes on them. And that's not true. So I, I try to break, I do a grandparentectomy at the discussion and, uh, mm -hmm, and uh, try and uh, um, tell parents what to do. 
So education and re-education seems to be important. And uh, your doctor also needs to have a lot of time to tell you these things. Okay. Right then. So usually one and a half years is a good time and children should sit for five to ten minutes at least once a day. And the uh, important thing is if someone is very keen only to use the western style toilets, to put a stool under the leg so that the body assumes a squatting posture. We did discuss squatting is the best position, most physiological and uh, maybe the western style toilets are not great for toilet training. Next one please. Uh, so we talked about diet and the fluid and the fiber. Next one please. And we said gram to gram, green leafy vegetables are the best. But however, they're not very popular with children. So they need to be sneaked into their diet somehow or the other. Next slide, please. So constipation, it's not a quick fix, important. It can't be sorted in 15 days, one month. It takes time for the fear of passing motion to overcome. If I tell someone, you'll be okay if you go to poo, they'll be happy. But you can't um, make a child understand that. And uh, sit on the party at a relaxed time where the morning school run is not there and all the kinds of morning activities are put to an end, the iPads can be put away and the TV can be turned off, etc. And toilet training is a key. And do not hesitate to give laxatives for a long time. That's particularly important. Thank you so much.